Right. Good morning, everyone. This open meeting of the Coastal Resilience Advisory Committee is being conducted remotely pursuant to Chapter 20 of the Acts of 2021. For this meeting, the Coastal Resilience Advisory Committee is convening by a video conference via the Zoom app as posted on the town's website identifying how the public may join. Members of the public wishing to participate in the meeting must use their full name for Zoom access. If full names are not used, people will not be allowed to participate in discussion. The town reserves the right to remove any member of the public who doesn't use a full name or who acts inappropriately. I am Mary Longacre, Chair of the Coastal Resilience Advisory Committee. As a preliminary matter, permit me to confirm that all members and persons anticipated on the agenda are present and can hear me. Members, when I call your name, please respond in the affirmative. Gary Beller. I would think we have Gary, but he's on a phone and may not be able to unmute. Um, so we will check in with Gary a little bit later. Sarah Boyce, Sarah come in yet? No, no. okay. Um, Peter Brace? Present. Matt Fee? Hi, I'm here. Ian, Ian Golding? Here. Jen Carberg? Here. Fritz McClure? Here. I don't see Joanna Roach, but I do see that Sarah has come in. Sarah, can you say hello as soon as you connect to audio? And Gary, were you able to unmute? Okay, so I do see Sarah and Gary on the screen. All right, staff, when I call your name, please respond in the affirmative. Uh, Vince Murphy? Here. Thank you, Vince. And uh, we do not have anticipated speakers for today. Uh, Sarah, can you say hello? Just so do we know you're alive and well? I am alive and well. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, so um, we do have a quorum. Um, all right, please note this meeting is being recorded and the all attendees are participating via video conference. Um, Ensuring public access does not ensure public participation unless such participation is required by law. This meeting will feature public comment. Accordingly, please be aware that other people may be able to see you and take care not to share your device's screen. Anything you broadcast may be captured by the recording and please silence all phones and devices when you're not speaking. The public is encouraged to follow along using the posted agenda, which Vince is displaying on the screen, um, unless the chair notes otherwise. All supporting materials that have been provided members of this body are available on the town's website unless otherwise noted. Before we turn to the first item on the agenda, permit me to cover some ground rules for effective and clear conduct of our business and to ensure accurate meeting minutes. The chair will introduce each speaker on the agenda. After they conclude their remarks, the chair will go down the list of members, inviting each by name to provide any comment, questions, or motions. Please hold until your name is called. Further, please remember to mute your phone or computer when you're not speaking. Please remember to speak clearly and in a way that helps generate accurate minutes. For any response, please wait until the chair yields the floor to you and state your name before speaking. If members wish to engage in a conversation with other members, please do so through the chair, taking care to identify yourself. For items with public comment, after members have spoken, the chair will afford public comment to those members of the public who have joined the meeting via Zoom. Members of the public who wish to speak must state their names and be acknowledged by and speak through the chair. If you're not able to participate in the remote meeting, you may also submit comments to the Coastal Resilience Coordinator, Vince Murphy, to be read into the meeting record. His email is vmurphy at nantucket-ma.gov. And finally, each vote taken in this meeting will be conducted by a roll call vote. Okay, uh, first item on the agenda is the approval of minutes from November 2nd. Uh, Vince, can you display those minutes? Did anybody have any comments or clarifications for the minutes of November 2nd? And thank you, Peter, for providing those. I move approval, they were great. <laughs> thank you, Matt, do we have a second? Second. Okay, uh, any further discussion? If not, we'll go to a roll call vote. Uh, Gary Beller, are you able to vote? Uh, Sarah Boyce? Aye, or approve. Yeah, Peter Brace? Aye. Matt Fee? Aye. Ian Golding? Aye. Jen Carberg? Aye. Fitz McClure? Aye. And Mary Longacre? Aye. Um, we should note that Gary is not participating um, at the moment. He does appear to be in the meeting, but um, he's not able to respond. Uh, and Joanna Roach has just joined us at uh, 10.05. All right, so meeting of, excuse me, the minutes of November 2nd are approved. We also have minutes from November 16th. Thank you, Fritz, for these. 
Any clarifications or comments on the minutes from the 16th? Hearing none, is there a motion to approve? Motion to approve. Thank you, Joanna. Do we have a second? Yeah. Thank you, Matt. Second, Matt. Um, Gary Berler, uh, not available. Uh, Sarah Boyce? Aye. Peter Brace? Aye. Matt Fee? Aye. Ian Golding? Aye. Jen Carberg? Aye. Joanna Roach? Aye. Fritz McClure, sorry, Fritz. Aye. And Mary Longacre, I those are approved with one abstention from Gary. All right, um, so update on coastal resilience activities from Vince. Uh, Vince, do you wanna start with that? Uh, thank you very much, Mary. Um, while I'm just chatting away here, would Mary, would you be able to just make sure people are admitted if they come along? Of course. Um, so, uh, I know it's a topic for later on the agenda for um, the discussion for select uh, the, the December 1st select board meeting, but the item that was on the select board meeting just before the coast resilience plan was a discussion about Baxter Road. Um, I'm pretty sure many of the committee members caught that. Um, so the, it's kind of, um, uh, for want of a better description, a two prong approach. So we're going to proceed with um, a new erosion control project that's going to be done as a new notice of intent um, that is uh, being pursued by the um, by town administration in coordination with um, SBPF. Uh, I have been asked to be the project manager on that and have I'm taking that on. The second part of this is to follow on from the um, uh, the report that was done by Arcadis on. Uh, the Baxter Road um, project that happened over the summer when we were trying to find a way forward and find a resolution. And the ultimate decision on that is to pursue uh, the road relocation. So those two projects are going to go ahead in tandem. Um, there's still trying to understand some of the finer details of this, of timing and when each will happen. Um, my guess, that's all it is at the moment, is that the erosion control project uh, will progress um, first as a notice of intent and we'll also push along the back to road relocation but that is something of a much larger project and there's a lot more to understand than that in terms of facilities that will have to move not just the road but all of the utilities um, the access agreements all of the uh, land rights the easements or the purchases or whatever form that's going to take so that's a, a more involved project so that might just take longer for that simple reason um, and be the second part of the product. So both of those are, are moving ahead and uh, at quite some speed at the moment. Um, we have the approval to proceed with the notice of intent and um, that was agreed at select board on the first. So uh, from there, we just have to understand how it's gonna work. Um, Arcadis are on contract for that now for the erosion control project and how that is going to look. We're going to have to collect information from SBPF and uh, try and see how, uh, what, what data we have and then understand what data we're missing and see if any more research might have to be done and then go ahead with the notice of intent from there. Um, no idea of the timeline for that. We're just trying to get this project established at the moment. That's uh, the purpose of briefing everyone on that today. Um, did anyone want to, oh, I see Sarah's got a hand up. Is that okay, Mary? Sarah, go ahead. Yeah, sorry, thank you, Mary. I didn't know if this was the appropriate time. I, I didn't want you to move on to another subject. I had a question. Um, so I'm interested in the, the road relocation, the initiation of that piece, um, because I just sort of want to make a plug for our group being involved in some of those parts. Um, and my, my motivation is that this could be seen as a precedent for some of the, like the, the way we go about it for some of the other areas. Um, I don't know for sure, but obviously this is like the first, it's not the first road relocation. It's the first road relocation since the coastal resiliency plan has been in place. And we know that it's not quite the same as, um, uh, you know, buyouts or whatever, moving of properties, but I think it, it might be looked at very closely with that in mind. So I would, um, I don't know if I'm overstepping Mary, but I don't know if there's a plug that we could make for being involved in some of that, those decisions, just thinking through, um, just because it's gonna be a potential precedent. 
or just having that discussion here now, what I, I think that's a topic we can be. put on another agenda. Uh, it's not a topic that's on today's agenda, but I think it's a discussion we could certainly have about what that might look like. Um, we could invite other people who are involved in the project to participate in that discussion. Uh, so I think that's a good suggestion. Uh, just to check with Matt, do you have any comments on that, um, on the direction that might take Matt or um, or what the select board would I, be open to? Yeah, I mean, I, I don't know, you know, I don't know with certainty, but I, I think uh, the su Sarah's suggestion is a good one. I think what this is going, this is potentially, we've, it's already been uh, this, there is precedent here, there is precedent Sheep's Pond, we've already had issues with some of these things and we've learned, you know, the town has learned every time, you know, good and bad. And so I think that, you know, getting some more eyeballs on the, you know, MOU or getting some more eyeballs on this as an example for the future is a good one. Uh, one of the things that sort of, I, I don't know, what worries me or always seems kind of crazy to me is when we're moving roads for the benefit of the people who live there and then they're opposing us. And so what, one of the tricky things is gonna be how do you uh, set up a process where that is, where it's cooperative and that is not, you, you're, not you're not tackling it from a, you know, a taking an illegal perspective, you take tackling it from a whole, the whole view, a holistic perspective. I think the mistake we made, you know, sort of one of the mistakes we made previously, we, and I'm not blaming anybody, but we looked at it only as northern part of Baxter Road. And, and we, we thought of just that one connection and we did a good job getting the golf club to agree and getting a couple of homeowners to agree on you know, that access point. But we do, what, we, what we really need to do now and is step back and say, okay, what's gonna be needed in this whole area? There are parts of uh, Pulpus Road that are gonna be underwater and not, you know, so we don't wanna be funneling roads to places that 10 years later are gonna be underwater themselves. So there's a lot that is gonna go into this and getting, uh, and getting a sort of a re resiliency betterment district and everybody to sign off on that is going to take, you know, take quite a bit of work. And it's gonna, and it's gonna take a lot of, you know, input from Arcadis and from, you know, from lawyers and everything else. This is not a simple, you know, as some people like to make it seem like, oh, just start, you know, just start moving the road. There's, it, it really is gonna be complicated but it has to be done. I think the town knows it has to be done and, and, and is working to do that. I don't, I, I think that this will be a, you know, my, I envision the Baxter Road being sort of a two-step process. The first step will be sort of cleaning up what's there and sort of, you know, and sort of extending it slightly and then having it, you know, an MOU and having it tied to sand and public access and resiliency betterments and hold harmlesses all the things that we talked about in the work group that came out about a year, year and a half ago, plus, you know, a sand study for the island, there's certain things that will have to happen before any second step is going to go on. And so, so we, I think we've got, I think we've sort of got a sketch of where we need to go, but there's still a lot of, you know, meat to put on the bones. Thank you, Matt. Um, I'll, I'll just also note they're dealing with this on the Cape too. We, Vince had forwarded an article uh, a couple of days ago that I saw about the Cape trying to figure out, you know, which roads are going to be saved, which roads are going, not going to be saved, uh, what the various importance of the roads is. So it, it's going to be a very interesting discussion, uh, not just for us. Uh, so we, we got a little bit uh, far afield there where Vince was giving a report on his coaster Zane's activities. So back to you. And Vince. a quick reminder to everybody, the state rules on road abandonments and all that stuff has not caught up with resiliency yet. And so they require, they require us to do certain things. And whether, you know, even if the road is going into the ocean, we're supposed to bring it back somehow, you know, so that, that all is gonna change, but it won't change, you know, while we're in the midst of trying to figure it out here ourselves. Thank you, Matt. That's a good perspective to have in our future conversation. Uh, Vince? Uh, thank you, Mary. Um, so I'm just going to take it that that covers the two points for the erosion control and the relocation and that people have gotten the update on that and that both are progressing. And then we'll move on to the fiscal year 2023 budget request from NRD. So um, it was part of the um, 
the uh, has mitigation plan. It's also been part of the CRP to have a sediment transport study. We've put in a, a, a budgetary request for that. That's um, in at the moment. Um, I just have to see how that uh, works its way through and see about getting uh, funds in place for that. It's hard to say how it'll go if there'd be an objection to it. I don't imagine there would be. You have to go through town meeting as, as everyone understands. And if the money is put in place, um, then I should hope at some point summertime next year uh get this underway uh i think sarah if, uh, had a hand mary yeah. if that's okay yeah i i see that go ahead sarah thank you i was just curious what the amount was for and if you've already like talked to people about contracting with the sediment transport work to know how much to ask for i'm just curious like it makes me it gives me an idea of how far along in the process we are with actually like shovel ready kind of project yeah so the number attached to it at the moment, as I know, uh, bearing in mind uh, this is kind of done by department heads, not necessarily at my level, just put that out there. So I'm not privy to everything in this, not even close. Um, I think it's about 800,000 is attached to it. And that was based on an assessment that we had done about two years ago to understand what it would cost to get that. And we just, it was pretty comprehensive at the time. Um, so we're just working with that at the moment. Um, the other part of the financial uh, of the fiscal year 23 to understand is, um, and I kind of have to put the plug in for Joanna here, uh, she is the resilience fund request. Um, I, I quite like this idea and I hope it moves ahead. Um, and I know that Joanna is an at large member here, um, not rep rep representing FinCom, but we can't ignore the fact she's on FinCom and uh, we have a friend there, hopefully. Um, so that's something that would do us uh, well, and that would be terrific if it were to proceed. But um, I will just let that one play out as is um, and uh, hopefully not influence people, just make people aware that it was something that was discussed as far as I know. Vince, any dollar figure attached to that concept? Not that I know. Okay. Not that. Uh, Jen? Thanks, Mary. Vince, could you just, so for clarity, resilience fund request you're looking to request money to start to build a fund to be able to pull from for future resilience projects. Am I under, is, is, was that the intention or is it something else? Uh, no, that's about correct. Um, but I'm also happy to say that uh, I'm on the outside of this one again, unfortunately. Um, if I had uh, to put in a request, I'd put in for large numbers, but I don't know what we're going to need and this is going to be some of the phasing that we need to understand properly first. So you remember uh, from reviewing the CRP, this, uh, that whole table that says the order that things should go in. Um, it's, a kind of, it's a lovely table, but it's somewhat confusing because it starts out in six month phases and then goes to one year and two year and five year phases without any difference in length and the graph. You have to understand that the X axis shows time in an unusual way to understand the phasing in that. So it's trying to understand how the next, well, basically for, uh, FY23 and what we can accomplish in that year, and then what we've got to put into successive years after that, and what amount of money we need to start putting into a fund like that if it were to ever get approved. Um, that's, I'm sorry to say, or happy to say, depending on your perspective, way above uh, my level. Thank you, Vince. I want to note that Gary Beller has joined via video. Uh, Gary, can you just give us a quick hello? Yes, hi. Thanks, it's hard. I tried to, uh, you know, I was traveling on the Florida Turnpike at 65 miles an hour, and I couldn't figure out how to get the video, how to get the sound going. So. Safety first, Gary. Uh, okay, so Gary has joined us at 1018. Uh, Jen, you have a comment? I had one more question. Thank you, Mary. Um, Vince, could you just Kind of clarify what the sediment transport study is you know what you are doing with it and what it encompasses the areas that it encompasses and mm. what we're going to get out of it thank you this is something that we're still trying to understand and we'll have to understand the budget first before we'll be able to understand what areas we can cover um we kind of need whole island sediment transport study that's understood that it needs to cover pretty much everywhere but I think the, we, it might have to be done in phases because it's also a pretty long and involved process. It's not the kind of thing that can be just done in one year. It might take a year and a half or two years to produce in phases even, like one phase just to do the harbours, Nantucket Harbour and Harbour together as one phase to understand what's going on in the internal harbours 
uh, would probably happen first. And then the outer coastline would probably happen at a later stage. They're pretty massive studies. One of the reasons to try and get the inner harbours done first and put a priority on that is that is information that we'd need to feed into the dredge plan uh, as it might be needed. And the um, a sand budget study would have to be undertaken as well. So you'd have to do be planning effectively three projects uh, at a time and understand the cost of them and where they fit together and, and how they ultimately work together. The downside is, and just not to ignore this, by the time we have all the sediment transport studies done, the harbour one could be two years older than the outer uh, coastline one. So that is a bit of a, a risk, but at least it's data that we need. Um, I understand that we need all the information as quickly as we can get it, but these are expensive and they also take quite a lot of time. Um, I, I don't know how we could get them all done any faster. It's an involved process, it really is. And let's just try and keep pushing forward on it. Sarah? And then Peter. Thank you, Mary. Um, I guess that's kind of to my earlier question. I know that, you know, um, Center for Coastal Studies has done a lot of the sediment transports in like Provincetown and other areas. And what's up? Um, are we contracting with them? Like if we, you know, because if you've already sort of requested the 800,000, is that like, let's say, let's say that goes through, because I know there's a lot of steps that have to go through before that money is approved for use. If that is approved, is that like when I say shovel ready, like, okay, then, you know, Dr. Borelli and or staff or whomever is going to be ready to go for it? Because if not, my suggestion would be, can we get what the numbers would be to do the whole island and the actual timeline from the experts that do it and then have that number ready to either re request those specific dollars or though that's the opportunity to seek grants? Because we know that that sediment transport study is the first step in not only the dredge plan, but all the you know aspects of you know sand nutrients and how sands are going to move and what it's like the first step when we decide when we look we start looking at these innovative projects. Um, the first step is like, well, how is it going to affect that the littoral transport around the island? Um, and so I think that's so so important. I would hate to do it you know, partially, and then it not be, you know, of like the data gets old before we're ready to really use it. So there's a couple of parts to this. I'm going to try and answer as whole as I can, and I might have to come back with my questions to make sure I answer everything now, Sarah. So the first part of the question was, is anyone under contract? No, absolutely not. It'll have to go through the whole correct public procurement process. Um, it might have to be done through RFP or something similar like that and then get advertised to take in the bids and then assess them and just do it that way. There's another thing that I'm working to understand that I just don't yet. Um, if we went with one group, just for the sake of argument, I'm just going to say a name, Center for Coastal Studies, it could easily be Woods Hole Group or anyone else. Do they have the capability to do it in one after the other in phases or do it all as one whole? Um, and it doesn't seem to be the case that they could do it as a whole. That's one of the problems. Then do we go with multiple contracts at the same time to try and do, say, the inner harbour, sorry, the harbours and then the outer coast at the same time? Then you're into massive expense in one year that we might not necessarily have or even close to it. Um, and then would the two different reports in the two different organisations match up enough that it would be usable? And if there was contradictions between them, where's the confidence gone? So there's a lot to try and understand in it, but it seems that's that's one of the parts in it. Do they even have the capability within one organization to take on such an enormous area? So that's something that we don't understand yet, but we're trying to work it out. I don't have an answer yet, um, but it seems like the harbors are more critical, which is why the focus is on that area. Peter? Yeah, um, Vince, I don't know if you had this, you see it, Vince? I think you gave me this and I photocopied it two it's years ago. It's a shoreline survey. I have an extra copy. This is basically a sediment transport study that was done in 1979. I can't imagine that the currents have changed all that much. I'm sure the movement of sand and the amount of sand has, but you should definitely refer to that. It, it gives you the directions of the littoral drift, the longshore current on all shores around the harbor. It's, it's, I would think it would be vital to this. So let me know if you want a copy. Um, I photocopied a copy of it. I think I have it in a box and I think I know where it made it from my office okay. move. 
So um, you gave it to me. I ended up having it on my desk for about six months until I gave it back to you. Um, so, but yeah, it's just it's just to say that you know the 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 coastal processes are are surely the same. You know, Smith Point is still growing because sand comes from from the east and runs down the beach, and Great Point gets its sand from about midway down Baxter Road and KOTU you know, continues to grow, the Nantucket Bar continues to grow because sand comes down from that direction. So I don't think that the currents have changed. I think we're concerned about how much is being moved and where it's going and, and how much sand is available to us. But you know, this, this thing would be a good basis, yeah, I think. So uh, before we go to Jen, I'm sorry Vince, um, I, I'll, I'll note that it's, it's my, sort of colloquial understanding, certainly not a scientific understanding, that the on the eastern shore, the uh, the patterns have changed. And that was part of the reason why Codfish Park stopped eroding and started building back up. And so I think from 1979, um, that's 40 plus years ago, it, it will be important to um, to do a second study to find out what's going on now. I think it's quite likely that there have been some changes, uh, not not wholesale, you know, not everything topsy turvy, but but there may be some some important small areas that have changed that have caused different patterns. Uh, Vince, I apologize, I interrupted you, and then we'll go to Jen. I just only wanted to agree that uh, what Peter said it's a very useful document, um, but it doesn't give any indication or even a, a, a direction of volume. Um, we need the volumes. That's what we kind of need uh, as much as anything else. Um, and then any localized movements, like really fine scale movements, just like say within the harbors where little bars move here and there and how that changes navigation. That's something that's missing from that report as well. But it's the kind of finer detail that we really need, but that's a terrific basis, um, that report. Yeah, also no, uh, we've had a significant amount of sea level rise since then, and that's also a potential cause for patterns to change. Uh, Jen, I've, thank you for waiting. <laughs> no worries, thank you, Mary. I think we might even have that report within our Coastal Resilience Library, possibly. I think I might have, one of us might have sent it over, the one that nice. we but, um, I just wanted to say, um, Vince, I understand the complexity of figuring out, you know, how to implement a project like this and get the people to actually do the work and what stages it happens in. I would encourage, um, you know, whether it's going through the RFP process or going, you know, through a direct um, contract that when the conversations start, that conversation starts with how, how is the best way to approach this project as an interior just the harbors or with the researcher looking at the whole island, because I remember in when Dr. Borelli came to present his talk about what he did out on Cape Cod in discussions with him, he was really excited about the idea of Nantucket because we are a closed system. And that would you know include figuring out sediment transport and budget around the entire island. So it sounded like there was at least a way to facilitate that, but that would be that conversation of what that timing would be. I would also put in the encouragement that doing the whole island sooner rather than later is pretty important when we think about how it seems like we're prioritizing some projects like Sponset Bluff that are putting lots of different kinds of sand, looser structures of sand than what occurs naturally. We're looking at a lot of coastal erosion projects on our outer shores and understanding how that sand is then contributing to sand movement around the island. I just think it would really help us from understanding what those projects are really doing and making sure that if they're getting permitted, they're getting permitted, you know, kind of in the correct way. I think that kind of a study would help inform that. Um, agreed, but um, getting something done in the harbor would influence, it's, it's where the most of the population is and it would serve a much greater population of people than people in the kind of more scattered erosion zones. Uh, it doesn't deter detract from that we need to get th those areas done, um, but we just don't have to understand that first. You're right. Okay, so uh, Joanna? Vince, I just had a question about um, the dollars. So we've already had one, this is just a clarification, we've had one meeting with Capcom um, and FinCom about the current uh, requests. So is this in addition to the money that's already put in? Like, was it a late request is what I'm getting at? Or was it part of the budgeting process? Sorry, for the for the um, sediment transport study? 
The That's sediment true. transport studies already in, but yeah. in the beginning of this, you said that you had put some money into coastal, a request for coastal resilience. So I'm just looking to know where it's going to show up. Oh, I'm sorry. No, I hadn't put anything in. Um, this was something that was discussed at uh, the FinCom, wasn't it? Um, and that it was something that I, I thought yourself and was it Matt or somebody had said yeah. that this is a good idea. That's what I was referring to. Okay. Okay. I just wanted to understand if there was an additional sort of last minute request. Okay. No, that was why I was saying, please continue your good work. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So we, we, sounds like we're, we're sliding right into the next agenda topic, which is grant application planning. <laughs> uh, so Vince, uh, it's, it's interesting that, um, of the, the five uh, items that we listed in the agenda, the sediment transport study and the, the dredge plan and the uh, sand budget are not on that. Can you comment before we start on the others about um, where that priority for those three uh, related studies is relative to the five that we listed on the agenda? Um, to look at the five that are listed on the agenda for the next topic, topic five, grant application planning, uh, yes. Those are things that myself and Trevor are trying to push forward separately. Um, the ones for the sediment transport study that's being followed at a departmental level here. Uh, the, the, the budget, sorry, the sediment budget study would follow on after that. Um, so we don't need to have that um, begun or started in that process until we have a handle of, say, maybe, I don't know, kind of picking a point here halfway through the sediment transport study, or at least the first one, so that we can understand where sands could dredge sands could go or where sands need to come from and that kind of stuff so that one isn't needed just yet um what was the third one uh dredge plan oh sorry dredge plan uh, would come once we know where the sandbars say it within the harbors yeah. are a problem so the, these are the kind of the the stepwise things that just have to happen first then these other ones these five that are listed here um there are other areas of the island and other kind of um say more cerebral you know the, the 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 other planning things like the bylaws and those kind of things um so if i could just talk about those for a moment but but before right. you start so i, I want to clarify that uh, on our agenda item five mm -hmm. we didn't specify but i think the intent was that um we have some money left from the coast resilience planning process that we're going to use to do grant application preparation and so this item is specific to that process, which is outside of the departmental process of pursuing the sediment studies. Is that a correct statement? Yes. Yes. Okay. All right. Go ahead. So I, we didn't have that clearly stated in the agenda. So I wanted to make sure that that was stated for everyone's benefit. So um, just to talk about the money that's available for this first, um, there was 27,000 in the contingency fund that Arcadis had. Um, to get the project finished and to get the CRP document done and to deal with, well, quite frankly, the huge amount of public comment and various other comments uh, and to get a handful of things squared away. Um, I think about six and a half thousand had to come out of that uh, for the sub consultants to ensure that they could continue and complete their work as they're part of the CRP. I had to put that through town admin, it was agreed and that was then taken. I think there's about um, 19 and a half or so thousand or there are thereabouts dollars left out of the contingency fund now to use for this. So when I was chatting with Trevor about this, this is only just to introduce these five as an idea. I don't need a vote on these today or anything like that. This is kind of preempting the conversation that we're going to have with Trevor probably at some point in mid-January about this. Just to get people thinking about this. So there's kind of five things that we were looking at. If we did one big project that would take, say, something like federal money, that's doable. If we had one small project that could, say, be an MVP project and a CZM project separately, they basically only do one of those at a time, so to speak, um, that could work too. So this is kind of where we are and what we're trying to understand. Do we try and pursue some federal money for one of these five for the sake of argument, or do we try and pursue some state level money and try and do maybe two of these at that level? Um, and then would we even be successful with any of those? So when we were looking at it, one of the most critical and crucial things we need to do is start moving forward on the downtown uh, neighborhood flood barrier research. So it's just research and development. It's to get it kind of from this concept phase up to uh, a higher planning phase, uh, about 30% design. And, but that would also then allow you to start taking it to um, 
so if we had this done and got it to a 30% design phase and had some understanding of the impacts to the public, to businesses, to property, basically, then we could then have to do another grant after that to get it to the kind of like 90% uh, or shovel ready phase. Um, but this is going to be a long and involved one. This is a massive project because it affects an awful lot of people in a very public way. So this would probably be seven, 10 years by itself of working through this one. I just want to make people aware of that, but we could pursue this one probably um, say through MVP or some potential federal grant. And there's kind of these federal grants that they're kind of preemptive to just try and understand projects. They would give you something like fifty, sixty thousand dollars to do a research. The town would have to come up with a 25% match in that. Um, and then that just kind of does the research phase of the project to understand viability, to understand impacts, to understand the people impacted, uh, sorry, the, um, the buildings impacted, those kind of things. So that's kind of the level I'm talking about with that one. Uh, for the raising of Madicate Road at First and Second Bridge, it would be, um, say, more like um, potentially an MVP level grant is kind of what I was thinking um, more than anything, but that would get you to uh, a more ready, shovel ready phase. Uh, than the um, neighborhood downtown flood barrier system. Just to kind of put it out there for the raising of Madicat Road, this might be something that we might have to do in concert with them, um, uh, sewering of Madicat if that were to ever happen as well. Two birds at one stone kind of thing just make, make sense rather than trying to um, put in a sewer and then build a road on top of it and then have, have it accessible. That's just what I was thinking in that one. Uh, the coastal protection for the sewer beds, that's one of the largest pieces of inf infrastructure that the town owns that's under a direct threat at the moment from erosion. Um, Morgan uh, was out there yesterday looking at the site and basically the beach is gone and another day or two and we're going to start seeing coastal bluff going away in that area again. Um, I think when I got a text from David Gray yesterday, I think he said 146 feet from the fence uh, down to one of his permanent markers, a metal pole in the ground. Um, one hundred and forty-six feet from the fence to his marker, and his marker is about twelve feet from the beach. That's his, the one that's still on land at the moment. He has another two that are out in the water that he put in over time. Um, so that is an area that would be worth getting on with, trying to do something with. Um, then there's the. Uh, would you look at it as one or would you look at it as two, doing something with zoning and wetland bylaw update, either together or separately? Doing it together has some benefits in that they would then be somewhat tied together. They end up with wetlands tied in with zoning. That was one of the reasons why they were put together. Now, they could be pursued individually, but that's just one of the ways that we could see co-benefits. Uh, then there's the stormwater management plan that's sorely needed. Um, getting funding together for that would have to be substantial. We'd probably need a couple of hundred thousand. I have no idea of a real figure on that, but just at that type of level is all I'm trying to say. So I just kind of want to get um, a temperature from the committee uh, of not a vote today, don't need a vote today, of what people think about this um, and if there's anything we should start preparing for in particular, or if this just warrants more discussion when Trevor comes back with this um, at some point in January. Yeah, so just again, a reminder, we're talking about giving some direction to Arcadis about where we'd like them to, um, to deliver uh, preparation for grant applications. Um, you know, is, is there a project that you think we, we ought to say, start here? Gary, and then Sarah. Mary, um, I thought when the select board was talking about um, uh, the Baxter Road project. Uh, I I was I'm, I'm under the impression that when they're doing that uh, NOI, the notice of intent, they were going to use Arcadis. And it, the first, so my question is, is that correct? And if so, how is how is Arcadis being paid for the work doing, assisting the town on that NOI? Is it coming out of our twenty seven thousand dollars, or is it a new twenty? Or is it a new amount? Vince? Uh, not, not coming out of ours, Vince. Uh, you have more details? Yeah, it was part of the discussion on the night. The first thing that they had to do was a gift acceptance. So the money is coming from SPPF as a gift so that they're not just going to have control. The town gets the money. The town runs the project. The town has the control. Um, that's 
basically the funding model for this. Is that fair, Matt? Okay, thank you, He's Matt. Yes. Head. Not. Uh, and Sarah? Yeah, um, thanks, Vince. Uh, I think, thank you, Mary, for the explanation of kind of, you know, why these five projects. And I think what is important for us to think about is which of these projects, like, since, since we're using Arcadis's expertise in this, which ones do we have the least knowledge about that we really need them to kind of help push us this through? Um, I don't have the answer to that, but also, um, and then, you know, obviously the priority, but then, you know, a lot of our projects that we've been talking about are planning projects, which are necessary, but I don't know if we need to do one like physical project, um, for the community to show that we're, you're, you know, we're doing work. I know the, like, obviously the sediment transport, the sediment budget, um, the storm, all these plant, like the stormwater management plan, the downtown, like the downtown um, flood barrier isn't the barrier itself, it's the research to do the, the barrier. All of that is completely necessary and I understand that. But I think that we also have to prioritize at least one physical project is just, and I don't know, I, maybe that's not here, but I just kind of wanted to put that plug in. And that's where um, a lot of people, maybe, you know, the raising of Madikit Road and first and second bridges, I know that's probably another planning project, but in, in the sense of um, uh, also wanting to make our priorities equitable. So we already have a lot going on on the um, eastern side of the island. Um, Madikit Road is already, you know, significantly impacted. Um, I'm, I'm just kind of throwing out ideas because with five projects, it's really hard to prioritize since they're all really important. Um, so I don't, I don't really know where I'm going with this. So just to think about like wh where we think that Arcadis can be the most helpful aside from, you know, what we are able to do. And th thank you, Sarah. And just a reminder, this is solely for grant writing. It's not for any uh, actual uh, engineering or uh, scientific inquiry. This this is specific to grant writing. So the expertise would be in the area of getting federal, state, or other grants. Uh, I, and I don't know how you know how that Arcadis expertise feeds into that, but I think that's a good question, Vince. And then Joanna. I just, I just want to throw it out there that if there's anything people particularly want to talk about that's not on this list of five, I'm fine with that. Uh, do you want me to share this list of five on screen, or do people have their? Uh, yeah, Vince, go ahead. Uh, and then Joanna, if you have a comment. I do. Um, just about Arcadis and sort of the track record with grants. Like I'm wondering, have we asked questions like what's been their experience with other communities? Have they gotten other communities different, different or certain types of grants? Like what is their capability and how do we begin to understand that? Uh, Vince? Um, is there anything in the original uh, proposal from Arcadis that addresses that? I think that was one of the evaluation criteria. Good question, I don't remember. Um, but just to talk about their grant writing history, um, they, they did the Coast Resilience type plans for New York and Boston, and they've brought in tens of millions in grants for those locations. Um, I don't know about smaller communities off the top right. of my head. So um, do they, have they given us like a list of these are like the five grants we think you are the, you meet the criteria, the highest level of criteria for, like where, where are we in the analysis of what the potential of this work can generate for us? Um, that's a bit of a, a tough question to answer because when grant making organizations <clears throat> put them out every year, they change what their requirements yeah. are. So yeah. that's kind of well, we have to wait and see what they put out to see what we can apply for and then match it up with a, say, a CRP recommendation. So that's half the problem. Um, but they've been exceptionally good at getting MVP, CCM and federal grants. Um, that's what myself and Trevor are mostly talking about. There's another um, organization, oh, C Grant. They've gotten several of those. We've talked about them as a potential funding source as well. Um, so there's plenty of options out there. It's how to write it to get the most bang for the buck. That's kind of one of the things. Right. Um, just to also ask the question, I don't know if I did this two seconds ago or not, short-term memory is gone. Um, did I say that any other projects people want to suggest? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So, 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 oh, sorry, Mary, can I ask one more question? Yes, about go ahead, Joanna. So, so maybe I'm just asking this, or, or I just need to ask this in a different way, Vince. So is it possible to get Arcadis to tell us 
like to bring it down to this very simple level of these are the five grants we think you should apply for because these are the highest likelihood of things that you would qualify to get. Like, have we gotten that specific or no? Uh, to some degree, yes, but not as you're hoping for an answer. So if you look at it, say for the first one, the downtown neighborhood flood barrier, that's a pretty major, very expensive project. So it would be better to start that one for the sake of argument in a federal stream, get a federal grant for that one first to do the planning on that then that would then tie into a larger scale federal grant once we get towards the construction phase that they'd be more willing to fund it then. Um, I'm trying to remember the name furiously of the granting system, just gone out of my head, I'm sorry. I think that's a question that we would ask Trevor to be prepared to address when we do talk to him about this is, um, you know, to, to point us in the direction of likely sources uh, for whatever projects we're looking at. Um, can I just put out one other thing as well? Um, sure. So everybody loves MVP and we're an MVP qualified community so we can apply for those kind of grants. I'm trying to or also organize internally. I haven't done much on it this week. Uh, a, a meeting with other town staff to try and find out what other uh, MVP grants they want to put together. Um, basically, we can put several in, but they'll basically only grant one per community per year. That's kind of their rule of thumb. And I want to make sure that we're kind of at the head of that. So I'm trying to organize the staff internally to see what we apply for. We also have to remember that the HMP plans, um, one of the reasons we got on MVP is because of hazard mitigation. So they might have some projects in their stream as well that I'm going to have to coordinate with Holly on. So we have to understand that too. What's the internal competition between the town departments? And, and Vince, uh, on the flip side, I would hope that there are some projects that more than one town department would support um, so that we can get a broader base of support to advance some of these priorities. Yeah, I'd agree with that. And what I would do at that point is um, seek letters of support from those town departments. Uh, Mary, Matt has a hand raised. Yeah, yes, I see it. Uh, Matt, go ahead. Yeah, well, sort of what I've come to understand from listening to them is we are uh, quite a bit ahead of a lot of other smaller communities that we've done we're in a we're good shape the sooner we can get these applications in get this organized in the better we will be and if in the you know they also will take into account our seriousness if we're figuring out how to fund some of this ourselves we're going to be more you know looked at a bit more positively uh, than you know, and if we've got our planning in place, then communities that are just really starting. So, you know, we're doing the right thing. I just don't, I want to make sure that we, we keep at it and we, and we start putting money aside like we've talked about. Thank you, Matt. Uh, so, uh, Jen, go ahead. Thank you, Mary. Um, I think this list looks, it looks pretty good, Vince. I would wonder about maybe, maybe not an addition or taking away, but if at least having a discussion about some of the Pulpus Road um, elevation and changes, just because it sounds like I kind of see, you know, Madikin and Pulpus as, as even, but it also sounds like we might have to wait a little bit longer, a little bit more complicated on Madikin when we think about tying in the sewer stuff as well. So I think it doesn't hurt to at least, you know, put it in front of Arcadius and see what they think might be the better one to go after. Um, and then the other thing I was wondering is, you know, it's, we, we keep talking about the fact that it's the infrastructure that really figuring out how to protect infrastructure is probably what we can do best as, a, as you know, town uh, projects to help protect the community. And I wonder if we want to tie in um, the steamship resiliency piece to that downtown neighborhood piece and or having it separate. I don't know, you know, what is going to be most effective, but it sounds like we're really looking at Arcata is probably starting the granting process on the planning stages, um, you know, of things. So there's definitely a lot of, you know, it's, it's writing grants to figure out how to do the planning and engineering. So why not aim bigger if it makes, <laughs> if it makes sense and gets us, you know, a good, a good project um, on the books, having those downtown protection plus that, you know, connection to the mainland infrastructure piece might look good to a granting agency. Um. Uh, Matt, ask? go ahead, um, and then we'll go back to Vince. Yeah, just a quick. Uh, it, this is just me. I'm not. I'm not sure about uh, sewering Madikit. When I look at the picture, you know, I'm not sure whether that's a good idea. 
when I, you know, and, unless we understand, and some of the Matica residents have said that, uh, it will lead to further development, which is for, you know, further, and it might not be more homes, although it will be, it'll be more second homes, it'll be larger homes, it'll be more hardscaping out in an area that is, you know, sort of one of the places that we should really be thinking about retreating from in the, you know, in a certain time frame. And so in, the more investment we put there, uh, you know, I, so anyway, I, that's some of the questions that I have when we're talking about this. Sometimes, you know, is there a better way to do it? Is there, you know, is there a, a small treatment plan? Is there PVC pipe and high pressure piping or something else that is easier to take out and more temporary that we should be considering? I'm not, I hope that we are considering that as a community. And so there's certain aspects, you know, I, Anyway, I'm not, I don't have the answer, but I hope that we're thinking about it because of the, the situation that we'll have out there in time. Thank you, Matt. And Vince, uh, then I have a comment and then we'll go to Ian. Okay. I kind of want to ask Jen a question if that's all right. Mm -hmm. And I kind of want to figure out part of it. Um, I don't mean any of this in a negative way. I'm just trying to understand the issues. Um, so you you talk about raising Palpus Road, Jen. Um, and I'm, I'm, I'm kind of guessing you meant at Folgers Marsh, not at Sackage Pond. Um, well, they're both indicated kind of at the same priority level within um, the CRP. So it was, yeah. they're, they're similar uh, issues to what we're having in Madiket. And so that's why I wondered if we want to just have that part of the conversation. I know some of the modeling or at least the background work is potentially farther along um, yeah. for those projects. So just to kind of point out, there are different numbered projects. They're kind of identified separately. They're tight, you're right. But there's kind of a couple of different things going on out of there. First, there's an issue with uh, Sackage Pond. Um, there's a trespass issue that basically has to be fixed first. Um, so we need to understand that and try to rectify that situation before we can even begin to start planning on what a new layout for Sackage Pond would be. Uh, I have a, a, an old memory. Um, that there's also some local interest from a local homeowner at the Fulgers Marsh area for them pursuing uh, raising the, the road in that area themselves. It's been talked about before. I just don't know where it is. And that's a DPW uh, conversation. I'm not privy to. So there seems to be some problems and some other things that need to be looked at in the Palpus Road area first. Um, and I, I don't know how to broach this next topic without sounding callous. Um, when you look at the Palpus Loop coming back to, uh, to Sconset, there's kind of two access points, some major issues, but two access points there. If that area gets flooded or icy or whatever, you just can't get from Quidnet back into town in either direction. But there's at least options. When you look at Madikit, um, they only have the one access road, and then there's kind of a, an extremely poorly kept um, secondary access road across um, private properties and across uh, Massasoit Bridge into that area. So it's not a good alternative access route. So it kind of means that Madikit's access through Madikit Road has quite a high priority. I know all three are down with priority one projects. Um, so it's then at that point, how do you define the difference between any of those three raisings? Um, taking that Madikit Road would be two raisings done at once at First and Second Bridge. And then that any raisings at uh, Fulgers Marsh and Sackage Pond have issues attached to them. Um, so would that mean that Madikit Road is kind of a bit more of a priority because they have no other good alternative access or egress in an emergency situation? Um, then for Matt's talk about Ma uh, sewering Madikit, um, I don't want to get too far down that road or tying the raising of Madikit Road into that too much. It just seemed to me to be something to consider and not have to go disturbing a brand new road surface. Um, if it was ever to happen. I don't mean to tie us in with that. Um, it, they are separate projects, but I can just see the benefit in linking them. Thank you, Vince. Um, so one of the things that I wanna um, put in as, as my um, priority is where are there issues today that we need to address? So we, you know, we have flooding on Easy Street, that's an issue today. Uh, the Sackage Pond area of Pulpus Road, that's an issue today. Um, Madigan, not first and second bridge, but you know Ames Bridge or Massasoit Bridge. You know those are potential you know issues that people could be suffering an impact from. Uh, so I mean, I want to make sure that we're not always looking down the road twenty years if we have a problem today that needs to be addressed. 
And I think that's uh, you know, a public service to, to address issues that already exist, not just um, the equally important uh, planning for the future. Um, all right, I think we said Ian next, and then we'll go to Jen. Thank you. Thank you, <clears throat> Thank you Mary. So you sort of took the words out of my mouth. And I was wondering if we were putting the cart before the horse. And um, in, the, in the Coastal Resiliency Plan on page 76, um, on the copy I have of 146 and their double pages, uh, I would like to draw everybody's attention to the, the aerial view of the downtown area. And the, the heading is near-term strategy 2020 to 2030, so exactly what you're saying. In the next 10 years, they're talking about elevating, uh, elevating Washington Street and Broad Street and putting in um, elevating Steamboat Wharf, a barrier with access to the wharf. And you know, from my point of view, that's an absolutely fundamental level. Um, the most important aspect of all of this is to make sure that the ferry continues to run uh, no matter what, because it's our lifeline. So I urge everybody to have a look at that if they haven't already. And I would hope that we would incorporate that into uh, you know, the most important thing from my perspective to focus on in the near term. Thank you. Thank you, Ian. Uh, okay, Vince, uh, Jen, and Jimmy, you took your hand down. <laughs> I just want to ask Ian, what's that page number? And I can share it on screen if you wish. So um, let me just, let me see. Um, can I, so here, can you see that? <laughs> so it's, it's page 140, page uh, 76 of 146 um, on that particular copy. Uh, I, yeah, so page 145 in the final version, Vince. Okay, so uh, 70, strategy, but it does say it's 76. Yeah. Well, so whatever it is. But it, it, to me, it encapsulates um, pretty much everything that we need to focus on for helping downtown in, in the next 10 years. That's their opinion. So, uh, Vince, I have it up if you want me to share it. or I've quite literally just gotten to it. Okay, great. Yeah, and I think you might be looking at the draft CRP as opposed to the final I CRP. Might, I might well, Mary, because yeah. it's on my iPad rather than yeah. on my laptop. <laughs> so thank you. Yeah, so Ian, is this the slide that you were referring to? Yes, it is. Thank right. you. Yeah. Uh, just as an FYI, I'm always happy to put up stuff from the CRP. <laughs> just give me the right page number and I'm good. Yeah, so... Um, so this would be item number one on the list that we have on the agenda, um, as opposed to the other items. I, I, we have 40 recommendations in the CRP. There's no getting around the fact that we have 40 things that are important. Um, we just need to know where to start and we need to know where to apply Arcadis's um, talent in grant writing and in identifying grants. So that's, that's the real focus of this question. Um, I mean, I would say that potentially federal grants would be a better use of Arcadis's time than state, which we're already familiar with. Um, just throwing that out there. Uh, Sarah, did you have a comment? Yeah, thank you, Mary. Um, I think, you know, to what you just said, I was going to kind of jump piggyback on that of, you know, what is, once again, outside of our expertise, and I say our, not mine, like the big R, and I think we've gotten MVP grants as a town before, so that's a good point, the federal grants, and I think, um, I think Joanna made a really good point earlier that, you know, looking at what Arcadis's track record is, and if there's, like, for them, low-hanging fruit, that is something that we're not familiar with, I think, um, I don't know if Trevor has indicated any of that or if we can look at what they've done just, you know, because we want our 20 whatever thousand dollars to go a long way. And I think, um, you know, we have so many projects and we all have different things that we think are the priority. And so I think just like whatever Arcadis thinks they can get through, I feel I would feel more comfortable with that because we're going to we're going to pursue all these things. It's not it's not a matter of like 
one not happening because another is. And so I think Mary bringing it back to what Arcadius's particular expertise is, is a good point. So thank you for that. Thank you, Sarah. Uh, Jen and then Vince. Jen, you're muted. Yeah, okay. There Thank you, you Mary. <laughs> I took my hand down before because you said you were going to come back to me. <laughs> oh. <laughs> I just, I think this conversation is really good. I, I like what Ian brought back to the downtown, and that was kind of my point of including the steamship wharf, wharf in that discussion. I think these infrastructure pieces are really where our biggest bang for our buck is. And if that's what we can get Arcadis to actually help us with, I agree that's not where a lot of our expertise lies already. So I, I, I like the idea of seeing if this is feasible with them. Um, I do want to say by bringing up Pulpus Road, I was no indication that Mattica was any more or less important. Um, we have had instances where you can't get around to the other side because Milestone Road is blocked. So it's every everything is important in some way. Um, I did want to do the plug, though, that um, just because there might be issues with a certain project or things we have to work out, it's not worth figuring out how to push ahead. It's still a high priority. And I know things get complicated with property owners and, you know, abutters and, you know, relationships with what the town needs to get done in different departments. But that's why we're here just to bring all these issues forward and then we can discuss them and see if, you know, there is a way forward on particular projects. And yeah, to convince with Pulpus, at Folgers Marsh, people are interested in it, but nothing has ever happened. So something like this would be a push if it ended up being a priority to actually, you know, move that project along in a, in a positive direction. That's all. You, you could almost say that the harder it is, the sooner we should start. Um, yeah. um, so uh, the other point I wanna make is with downtown, we have the Harbor Place redevelopment looming and the more we know about how to protect downtown before that gets planned, the better off we'll be. Uh, Vince, you had some more comments, I think. Yeah, I just want to build on one thing you just said, Mary. If uh, if, it's, if it's a harder project started sooner, hardest project is what Ian had talked about is downtown. Um, just put that out there. Um, so I want to get back to one to answer one thing Sarah said. I don't even answer just say something I hadn't said before. Um, once, uh, so I have these hour long meetings with Trevor, trying to figure things out, trying to work out direction, which is when I figured in, I got to bring some of this to crack and trying to get this preemptively up on a screen and get people thinking about it. Um, but one of the things we're going to see with Arcadis is we're going to see a lot of new names. We're going to be moving kind of from um, some of the engineering people onto their grant building department. They have a department for this kind of stuff. They're that big. So we're going to see a lot of new names and a lot of, um, new people coming to talk and present once we get uh, in whichever plan we're going uh, whichever project we're going to start pursuing for a grant so they have quite an extensive amount of people um, based mostly in new england but up and down the east coast that are quite good at this i keep trying to emphasize we need people with a lot of massachusetts experience more than anything because we have an unusual set of laws here that's kind of one of the things i'm always pushing and trevor responds well to that and that's always terrific. But yeah, they have extensive experience with these kind of things. And we're going to see a new set of names uh, for uh, things to do with grants. But Trevor is still the project lead. So I hope, Vince, that they will be reviewing the 40 recommendations, you know, by the, the people who have the grant writing expertise and come up with some of their own recommendations for where they think they can uh, give us a big impact. Yeah, thank you. Uh, further comments? All right, if there are none, we'll move on to the next big topic, which is the discussion of, our, of the presentation to the select board of the Coast Resilience Plan on December 1st and next steps. Uh, well, first, thank you to all the committee members for attending that meeting and for speaking out on behalf of the Coast Resilience Plan. I think that was a very valuable contribution and I really appreciate that everyone was able to uh, be there. Anyone have... Uh, reaction that they want to share or thoughts regarding that presentation, Peter, and then Gary. Yeah, I have to say I was a little, <clears throat> I was a little frustrated the way they, you know, with all due respect for um, Matt in attendance, just a little frustrated that they put their acceptance, ado adoption of the plan off to the 12th. I mean, I, I, uh, what's going to happen between now and the 12th? Are they going to, 
not adopt it. We're going to go back. We're going to do the plan over the way though they like it. I just I get the sense that the select board didn't get the urgency of what what we are tasked with doing. Um, and Matt made the comment about governing at the speed of government, and that's all that was running through my mind when when the select board decided to wait. What I mean, what are they waiting for? I just those are my thoughts. Thank you, Peter. Gary? Well, I agree. I was going to say what Peter's saying. I do want to thank Matt Fee for trying to get them to understand that not a lot's going to happen if they keep delaying it even a month or two. And uh, I'm disappointed that um, they didn't show people who may have been watching the sense of urgency that we feel. So let's get going. This is just the plan not the details and what can we say? Well, what is what it is? That's what I wanted to say. Thank you, Gary. I, I think the, the fact that this is a strategic document, not an engineering document, perhaps was not, um, didn't come across to some of the select board members. Um, Ian, you have a comment? Well, yes, thank you, Mary, because I, I totally agree with Gary and Peter, and I think we're all nodding. And um, the fact that we put this much effort into it, I find it thoroughly disconcerting. And uh, thank you, Matt, for trying to get them to move on it. And at the very least, I hope they actually get to, around to reading it before they discuss it again. So thank you, Mary. Thank you, Ian. Uh, Matt? You know, my, my point, and I kind of messed up a little bit because I said, well, maybe it doesn't matter. But then I, when I started to think about it, I go, it completely matters because of the funding cycle and everything else that we're facing. So I hope that we, you know, I think that it will be adopted on the 12th. I think they understand the importance. Uh, and, and I hope that the importance will be reflected at FinCom and at the select board with some funding this year. So we aren't waiting to the next, for till this time next year so to move some of this forward. If we've got to get things done in 10 years, that means we need to be funding some of it right away. And so I hope that that's, I hope that that urgency is, uh, is, is understood. And, you know, may, and I know Libby has sent it out to com for comments to various department heads or just for, gen you know, I know she's making that effort. So maybe I think that'll be a positive because that will, uh, I think that will raise the level of importance of, sort of the funding and the other aspects of this, you know, community-wide through all the different staff. It, it's there, but I think, you know, sort of asking for any more, con you know, showing them that it's finished and it's important, I think can only help us going forward. Thank you, Matt. Joanna? Yeah, I, I agree with Matt. I think that, um, I do think that the select board and the finance committee are taking this very seriously. I, I don't think that the delay is a reflection of that. I do think that um, it serves us to be aware of some of the other thought processes um, in town around other committees or other people who want more time to think about this or digest this. And also for us to keep in mind that not everybody agrees with this and that there are other contingencies of groups on Nantucket who either don't fully value this, don't fully believe this, or think that this entire effort is aimed at diverting development, right? So there are those people who are out there and, and we have to be aware that they're talking to the select board too and they're speaking on their committees and they're making their views known as well. And so, um, I do think it's really important to acknowledge that, but uh, there is no part of me that doesn't think that the select board or the finance committee isn't taking this very seriously. Thank you, Joanna. I, I wanna, um, I, I had a thought come recently, you know, there have been comments about, you know, not scaring people and preserving the, the tourism industry and the real estate values. And to me, the best way to preserve the value and, and the industry on Nantucket is to show that we're serious about addressing the threats of the future sea level rise and climate change. Um, I mean, to ignore them, I think, would be a bigger disruption than to address them. So that, that's my view on that. Uh, Jen, you, do you have another comment? I did. Thank you, Mary. I just um, one of the things that was discussed when we were this with the select board was, you know, whether how we had shopped this plan around those other town departments, and I wanted to 
um, kind of give a shout out to what Vince said. I appreciated you coming in and saying that we, we've done that and the work that Vince and Mary and with Trevor had done with going to talk to the different boards already. I think, you know, we as a committee had done a pretty good job of trying to get the message out to all the places that we can. So I think it's just now sitting back and letting them digest it. And, you know, as Joanna said, I think that the select board's taking it seriously. So hopefully this does get you know, accepted in, in January without any, without any other kind of initial drama. We're going to have drama through the whole production of this, uh, of this plan. So hopefully we can start really moving forward in January. Thank you, Jen. Uh, Vince, I had asked Libby to provide suggestions for any other groups that she felt would benefit from a presentation. Did you receive any suggestions from her? Not yet. Okay. Uh, and then, of course, we all have the opportunity to uh, individually write a letter to the select board members, just reiterating the importance of adopting this. Um, we can certainly ask other people to do the same. Um, January will be here before we know it. So <laughs> just hopefully just a little ripple in the process. Vince? Um, just not to preempt Peter or anything to do with Harbour and Shellfish Advisory Board. They're meeting later today. And um, as is frequently the case, um, the, their liaison, Tara, um, asks if there's anything going on in NRD that that board should know about. And I said, well, yeah, here, here's this. Can you, can you see if they want to talk about how this went on, on December 1st and if they want to think about lending support? Um, but that's kind of for that community to discuss. Thank you, Vince. Further comments? Any suggestions? Uh, should, should we be doing anything um, to help ensure adoption on January 12th? Gary? I don't think we have to do anything to secure adoption. I think it'll probably be adopted fine uh, when they have that meeting. But, you know, I made a suggestion when Jason Bridges asked whether there's something they should be doing. I did make a suggestion and I'd like to repeat it here now. And that is that um, I think that the select board ought to schedule at least once a quarter, a quick question as how are we doing on implementing the coastal resiliency plan? I don't want them to approve it on January meeting and then not get back to us or we'll not get back to the population until the next January. And if they have put it on their schedule that once a quarter, we should have a quick update as to how we're doing. It'll keep people reminding that we have to keep moving forward on this. We can't put it aside because we might not have to worry until 28 or 29 or, or 2030. That's my thought. Thank you, Gary. Matt? Yeah, I agree with Gary. I'm not, I don't think we have to put a lot of pressure. I think that, I think it will be adopted. I, I do think Gary has a good suggestion uh, that, and we might be, we might ask to, uh, you know, to come quarterly, you know, to do a report quarterly or to come quarterly to, you know, to speak, you know, with this, you know, with the select board or administration. I'm not sure how the process would go, but to keep, if, if it's, we did this, the town is doing way better with financial stuff with Brian here and with the fact that there were regular uh, financial uh, reports to the select board. It kind of got everybody to focus on, got all the department heads to focus on it. We got the right guy in place. We started the reporting and it, it's way improved, much improved. The same sort of thing I think can happen in other areas that need improvement. And I think this is one of them. So I thought his suggestion was a really good one. I think that Joanna has it right. This is, there is there's some of the things that we're going to be trying to talk about, you know, when we start, when we go into the zoning or into the overlays or that type, when we start having those conversations, those are going to be very difficult. People are going to see that as taking rights away or taking future profit away, et cetera. Uh, I don't think they're going to do the math the same way. I don't think they're going to do the math. They look and say, Hey, I got this thing built and I got it. It's bigger, it's improved, and now I can sell it for more and I can move on. They're not looking at sort of 10 years, 20 years from now and 
in you know and and some people are looking at i don't mean this mainly but they look and say well you know <laughs> the flood the flood in brant point took us out of the we had a little bit of a blip you know back in 08 or whenever it was and it flooded and everyone had work for the winter so i, I think some people look at it as a positive and so i think that we're really uh you know we're going to have to be aware of that and proceed sort of I'm not sure how to proceed, but carefully be aware of that and proceed carefully, you know, in the right, you know, with the right and understanding that there are different views on it. Thank you, Matt. And that, that's one of the things I've tried to keep in mind is that this isn't all about playing defense. Um, there, there are benefits to coastal resilience activities, you know, creating jobs and work, for instance, creating better habitats or a cell fishing industry is preserved or um, creating additional recreational opportunities or, or whatever those might be. I think that's something that we need to include in our messaging that, you know, these projects are not just about repair or about retreat. Uh, these projects are also about um, having a more um, having a community that is stronger. All right. Any further comments on this topic? All right. Next item on our agenda: public comment. Do we have any members of the public present who wish to offer a comment? Please use the raise hand feature in Zoom. Uh, or if you have a comment, just go ahead and unmute and let us know that you wish to speak. Uh, RJ Turcott. Thank you, Chair. Uh, RJ Turcott on behalf of the Nantucket Atlantic Council. Uh, in thinking about the discussion earlier on the sediment transport study, I would really, really strongly ask Vince and town staff and this committee to reconsider prioritizing the harbors. Um, thinking back to last year's saga with 289 Comic Pond Road, that property lost 35 feet or more in 48 hours. And those people, as I think Ian Golding can attest to being on the commission, they came in before the commission, they did everything right, they got the property behind them, they removed that house, they went through all the paperwork, all the permitting process to move their structure away from danger. And it still wasn't fast enough. It still got pitched in the ocean when Paulette and Teddy came by offshore. And I understand Vince's point about how much of the population center is in the harbors, but I personally can't think of any folks in the harbor losing 35 feet in 48 hours. And yes, downtown is a priority. The ferry terminals are a priority, but those are, with accurate SLR projections, that's an engineering project uh, and a funding, finding funding for those projects. Those can proceed without a detailed sediment transport study, but these houses that are in extreme danger, as well as the airport, the runway strip going into the ocean at the end there, the airport, the sewer beds, these require a really intimate knowledge of sediment transport. And I just don't think it would be wise to delay it any further. And really from the land council's perspective and our members perspective, really think the harbors can wait. Thank you. Thank you, RJ. Other members of the public with comments at this time? Uh, if there are none, uh, Fritz, for the minutes, I'll note that Peter Brace left at 11.18. He had told us he would have to leave early today. All right, if there's no further public comments, uh, new business, uh, Committee and Natural Resources Department reports. Uh, Vince, you had a follow-up on um, your report from our last meeting. Yep, so the same day of our last meeting, I think it was the 11th, sorry, the 19th, Oh, don't remember. Um, I went off to speak at the Nantucket High School to the Youth Climate uh, Committee um, for uh, gave a half an hour presentation, a general overview of the CRP. Um, they find it dense. Uh, they're high school students. They asked for something that has been talked about here before uh, about a simple kind of summary or a one or two page overview. And I said, or I asked him a very simple question. I said, all right, it took me half an hour to give you a general overview. What from that would serve as a basic uh, kind of summary? And by the time I had my board and was writing stuff up, I said, how long do you think that would, if I fleshed all this out, would that fit into one or two pages? And they said, no. Um, it's, it's a 
considerable thing to do and it's very hard to do and I performed an exercise with high school students to try to understand it and it didn't work. Um, they were extremely interested in it and they wanted to know what they could do in particular. Um, I said, well, it's very simple. Um, speak up, make your voices heard. There's no age limit on coming to a committee meeting. I said, I know crack meets in the middle of the day when you guys are in school, but select board doesn't, planning board doesn't, they meet later in the day. Um, attend those meetings, understand those meetings. And, and if you want, you can send written uh, questions or comments and they can be read out here. And that's all perfectly fine. They seemed very into the idea. Um, as a follow-up, a few days later, I got an email from uh, a student. I don't remember his name off the top of my head now. I feel guilty about this. But he asked me a load of questions um, for uh, a column that he wants to put together for their school newspaper, Veritas. Um, and there's going to be something in there, I think, in the end of this month. Um, they are before Christmas, I'm not 100% sure. So um, I've been trying to get the youth engagement up um, and trying to get increase that as much as I can. Um, they're super interested in it, and they also are the ones that realize that they're going to have to carry a lot of these projects forward. They're going to have to go to school, become engineers, get qualified, or do whatever they're going to do, and then our activists or uh, financiers and come back and try and take up some of the things that we're talking about here for the next several decades. So that was something that was not lost in them either. Um, there was one other thing that was massively interesting from the presentation to the high school. Um, they kept focusing because they some of them flick through it and just just see pretty figures and this and that and one of the most eye-catching things is um the in harbor solutions and they kept asking oh when's that going to get done how are you going to do this or will there be x y or z and i kept having to say look this was only in there to as an understand an, an exercise to understand what that would look like but they also read the newspaper they saw that was in the newspaper as well and they thought oh yeah that's definitely going to happen they got the wrong end of the stick on that one um, and understandably so. So this is something that we're going to have to work to try and correct in the public sphere. Um, I know that the committee wanted it and it was very valuable to undertake that, but it seems that as though people take it um, as though it's, it's a project. It's not a project in the CRP, it's a, an understanding, it's a scoping exercise uh, to see if what might be needed in the future to look at a large project um, and it has its brilliant value there. But um, it's one thing that I kind of walked away thinking, it's in the newspaper, it's in the minds of these high school kids, it's something that they might have to face in the future, but it's not in our CRP as it stands today. How do we um, improve the understanding on that? And one of the ways that I'm kind of going to make a small bit of a pitch on to committee members, we don't have the education subcommittee anymore. Um, uh, I think it was dissolved pretty much this time last year. Um, but if we could have a standing piece about public education as an agenda item. What do people think of that? It's an interesting thought, Vince. Um, we can certainly put it on an agenda, but it really depends on what members of the committee are willing to do individually. Um, we can't just keep asking you to do everything. <laughs> uh, Jen? Thanks, Mary. Um, I think it'd be great to put that on as a future agenda item to discuss what education could look like and whether it's a separate committee or just we do it within the, the main committee and, and, you know, piece out responsibilities to, you know, whoever has time to take on a little bit more. Um, I think education is such a key piece. I, I completely agree. And, and it's something we can probably provide um, some of that work on. So I'd love to talk about it. Um, figure out what's what's kind of the best plan to, to do it so everyone it doesn't just fall on one or two people. Thank you, Jen. Uh, I want to follow up on Vince's um, presentation. The Youth Climate Committee is holding a climate cafe on Wednesday, December 15th at one o'clock at the Thomas Macy Warehouse. So um, they are attempting some public education as well. <laughs> Jen and Sarah. Thank you, Mary. If I, I saw that on social media last night, too, and, and sent a note to Sarah. Um, the Youth Climate Committee and Sam Kefferstan reached out to Sarah and I separately and asked us to come and talk to the students about um, kind of what we saw from a conservation standpoint in the CRP. And they our first response was, well, you probably need to talk to Vince first <laughs> to do a presentation they said he had already. So um, that event that's happening um, on the 15th, as far as we understood it, at least, was us meeting with the students and kind of presenting 
from a conservation standpoint, what the CRP objectives kind of were. So just a little clarity, because it wasn't in that uh, advertisement that we saw on social media yesterday. And Sarah, you also had a comment? Oh yeah, it was just basically the same thing as Jen. You know, uh, we were asked to, from that conservation perspective, because of work, other work we've done with Envision Resilience, Nantucket, and um, we, it was sort of told to us that it was going to be with the students specifically. So I didn't really realize it was going to be broad, um, advertised broadly to the community. So uh, we do need some clarification on that. But I just, I did want to say that too, because in case other people from the committee come to the meeting, I mean, we're talking about the plan. So I don't know if that counts as needing a meeting. I don't think so, because it's, it's high school student. It's, it's the perspective is, um, like what the youth can and want to do. So at, at the invitation does say everyone is welcome. So I think they are opening it up to the public. Uh, but for members of the committee, if you would let Vince know if you are planning on attending so that he can track whether we what might have a quorum and might need to post that. Um, you know, Vince, you can stand by. Uh, since it's Wednesday at one o'clock, Monday morning would be the latest we could post. So please this week, let Vince know if you're planning on attending. Um, so Vince, that was the Youth Climate Committee. Um, any other thing from the Natural Resources Department? Yes. Uh, nothing else from the Natural Resources Department. I just want to clarify, it sounds like Jen and Sarah are both involved in this presentation. So I don't need to hear from you guys. I'll just take it as two and then whatever comes after that, if anyone is attending. Okay, and I just wanted to uh, clarify one thing. Uh, the student who contacted me um, and who's doing the article for Veritas, uh, I just want to give him a personal shout out and thank you. His name is uh, Benton Killen and thank you to him. Thank you, Vince. Ian? Thank you, Mary. But, you know, if I have a cocktail party where I invite you all, it's not a meeting unless we actually discuss, you know, what crack business. So I don't see, they're not discussing crack business. They're, they're going strictly in a, a separate category. So um, I wouldn't have thought we'd be infringing any, any local regulations. Thank you. Thank you, Ian. All right, other reports from committees? No. <laughs> <laughs> no. Okay, um, so discussion of upcoming meeting dates and topics. So I wanted to go back to the January meeting date. Uh, our next meeting is scheduled for January 11th. The select board meets on the 12th in order to, we hope, adopt the Coastal Zanes plan. If we wanted to present any information or, or anything else to the select board, we would have to do so prior to January 11th. That would be a little bit late for them to consider it on the 12th. So the only question is, is there any desire or need for the Coastal Resilience Advisory Committee to meet prior to January 11th? Simply an open question for committee members. It didn't sound like people thought we had a lot of work to do. And not seeing anybody jumping on that opportunity. Um, so we would also meet then on the 25th of January, um, which would be almost two weeks later than the select board. Um, any reason to change our January schedule, either because of the select board meeting or for any other reason? Not anticipating any, just wanted to bring that up. I don't see any reasons. Um, so if there's no further discussion, we can take a motion to adjourn. So moved. Thank you, Gary. Do I have a second? Second. Thank you, Ian. Um, so roll call vote, Gary Beller. Aye. Sarah Boyce. Aye. Peter Brace has left the meeting. Matt Fee. Aye. Ian Golding. Aye. Jen Carberg. Aye. Chris McClure. Aye. Joanna Roach and Mary Longy. I'm oh, sorry. Aye. Jeff. And very long ago. <laughs> Thank you all. We'll see you in January. Merry Christmas and Happy New Year, everybody. Yes. Thank same. You, Gary. Happy <laughs> holidays. Thanks, Gary. I'm just going to stop the recording.